Hey guys, and welcome back to History Revision Success. Now, in today's video, I want to go through something which can be extremely daunting when you're approaching your A-level history exam, and that is how do I revise this topic? Um, the topics are broad, the topics are deep, and there is so much information. And I think it can be extremely difficult to know how to go about that in the most effective and efficient way. The other difficulty with the history um, papers is that there are so many different types of question you can be asked. And from my experience teaching A-level students, the one thing they always say is, I did so much revision, but the topic I didn't revise came up, or I did so much preparation, but something still came up I hadn't heard of or thought about before. Now, I have all the tricks in this video that I've ever um, developed with my own students, but that I want to share with you in, in order to really crack revising this exam in a time efficient, but also in the most effective way so that you are not sat there on the day with no idea what to write about, that anything that can come up we've already thought about the answer to and about a conclusion to, okay? So this is kind of the most fail safe way I have been able to come up with to approach the, the A-level history. So let's get started. Now, step one, I think the most important thing you do, you might do this at the very beginning of your course, beginning of year 12, beginning of year 13, you might actually decide to wait until the end of your course when you come to your revision period. But I think the most important thing you can do in order to understand what's going on in the entire course across the whole timeline, is to create for yourself a timeline. Now, people do this in different ways. Some people like to do handwritten, um, big sheets with lots of things coming off. From my experience, I found the most effective thing I did and I now do for any course that I'm coming to teach um, is I create a timeline like the one I've got behind me. Now, your course will either be chronologically separated by maybe monarchs, maybe leaders, prime ministers, presidents, whatever it is, you're going to have some sort of sector or some sort of spacing based on a person or a period of time. So what I've done is I've put down my um, first column, those people, those presidents in this case, because this is looking at the American dream reality and illusion course for this example. I've gone down my presidents and then all I've done is I've simply gone through the textbook and I've skim read the whole thing. And I've just in my table put down if it's got a specific date, the specific dates and the event. Now, this can seem a huge task. And yes, it did take me quite a long time. I ended up with about 10 pages that look exactly like this one with every single event I would ever possibly need to know from my course on it. However, I think in terms of time, it only took me perhaps say about eight hours. Um, I skim read the textbook, I took the textbook, I went through every page, but I skim read it and I just extracted those events. I didn't worry about any of the detail on analysis of impact or success. I didn't write any of that down. I just wrote down the events. I also didn't write down anything extra. So if I had um, events or dates or specific things that happened that I know because I went and read a histor historian's book about this event, I didn't include it because this is my basic timeline. Detailed, very, very helpful, but we're not going above and beyond for every single event that possibly happens in these years in America. We're simply going by the specification by the textbook to extract the main events. Now, you will notice that this is very different to this, for example. And here what I've got are some notes I've made from actually reading the textbook and extracting real information that's different to this. This is purely what happened, who was involved, if that's important, very, very short and snappy information, different to this. Now, I probably would do this as well, um, perhaps at a later point in my, um, my year, 
this is very important. This is also probably what you're going to take from your lessons themselves. These are the kind of notes that you gain through the lessons that you sit at school and you might not even need to do this. I, when I'm approaching a new topic, this is what I do. I take the book, I read the book, I make notes on it. If there was anything in here I wanted to go and research further, I would go and do that, okay? But when I say make a timeline, I don't mean make notes. This would take you 40 hours to read the whole textbook. This will take you 10, maybe eight, maybe even five if you're quick, okay? So we're extracting all of the main events. Now there's a very important reason for this and it's this. Um, sorry, one other thing I like to do when I do make notes as, as um, I've just shown you is I will also keep a table on a separate Word document where anytime I see an important definition or a word perhaps I don't know or a word that's key in terms of terminology to the course, I'll write it down in its own separate Word document. It makes it very, very clear. You can go back to it very easily. You can go and memorize these words. Um, it's not all kind of embedded in pages and pages of notes that you'll need to find again I find it much easier to do that as a little trick and a second little trick is as I'm reading the textbook and if I'm making notes on the textbook I will also start to think about what do I think the textbook is suggesting is the key question here is it really emphasizing how successful were Nixon's domestic policies is it asking and evaluating um, how stable Henry VII's rule was you know what is it getting at because the way these textbooks are written, they are AQA approved, they are written for the AQA specification. So if the textbook has a whole paragraph on, you know, were Nixon's policies conservative or not, you, you know in your head that that might be a key question to think about. So I also like to make lists of key questions. You can do it like I've just shown you, or you can do it like this. You can put them into a table as you go through um, with president, with themes, with questions as you go, okay? Personally, I like to have everything neat and tidy um, in tables, on the computer. For me, it's much easier. You can always return to it. If you prefer to handwrite, you, that's fine. That's your choice. Now, the reason I think doing the timeline is so important is when you approach these history A-level courses, they are often, well, depending on which type, whether it's um, component one or component two, but they're either spread across a very big time period or even if they're the depth study, and it maybe say is only um, 45 years, an awful lot happens in that time. And you will not necessarily be tested on the entire course, of course. What you will be tested on is a theme within that course. So what you need to be able to see in your head and in your eyes and in your understanding of this timeline is how the different themes change over time and how they all fit alongside each other. Because under Nixon, as an example, you've got to worry about multiple different things that Nixon was in charge of, that Nixon was changing and what happened to America at that time. So going back to my timeline, what you will need to do is decide what themes do these tie into? So the way to do that is to go, well, perhaps you might have a teacher that can help you and tell you that, or if you don't, go to the specification. Now you can find this on AQA website. So you just type into Google AQA, A-level history um, specification, and it comes up, you find your course. So I'm looking at the specification and I'm, what I'm looking for is commonalities. So this is just the year 12 um, specification and it's just for the American dream reality and illusion course. But I'm looking for things that are the same, that are trends across each and every leader, okay? And these trends are exactly the same as the year 13 course. I just haven't put those up there for you. So what I'm noticing is, is that we've got some writing here about the power of the presidency, um, perhaps why he was elected, what was happening in politics at the time. Now I'm looking under Eisenhower and Kennedy and yep, I have the same kind of category, um, power, politics, election, the same trend. So under each of my leaders, the specification, the exam board are suggesting there could be questions on the same theme. Now I'm looking for a second theme. So I'm seeing that we've got through all three of our leaders, we've got this idea of 
um, the Cold War, you know, under Truman, the Cold War and containment, under Eisenhower, um, superpower rivalry, and under Kennedy, we've got Cuba, we've got Vietnam, we've got Khrushchev, we've got Berlin, they're all the Cold War. Now, I think there's probably two other themes within this course. We've got um, domestic issues, the economy, society, protests, running through all of them. I've put that under blue. And in yellow, we've got the um, progress of the African-American right, African-American civil rights movement. Under each one of our leaders, the specification is clearly specifying they want you to understand about the position of African-Americans in society. So we've got themes. Now, going back to our timeline, as you can see, I've started to theme my events. I've started to think, okay, which ones of these are about the Cold War? Which ones of these are about domestic issues? Which ones of these are about African-Americans, which are about international affairs or politics? Okay, and I'm simply, for me, I'm coloring them in different colors because that works for me and my brain, my understanding. Now, here's an example of kind of more of that timeline as it goes down. Now you can stop at this point, you can say, I understand now, I can see it in my mind's eye, I understand the time, I understand the chronology, I understand the themes. Sometimes with some courses, I still feel a little confused. And I think before you even depart, or before you embark on trying to understand how to answer essay questions, you have to be able to really, really be happy and content with the timeline of what happens. So. I actually am going to go one step further with you and show you um, one more thing that I sometimes like to do with these timelines just to get it clear. Now, what I've done is I've created a second timeline and all I've done is put along the top my themes. I've kept the presidents down the, um, the, the left, the first column exactly the same. And then I've simply put all 12 months for each year in the next column. Then I've copy and pasted over from my first timeline, each event into the right month under the right theme. So now I've got a living timeline. I've got all of the space that I should have. So I know immediately that under Harry Truman, in terms of domestic affairs, nothing really happened until August and in, in 1945, for example. Whereas I know that as soon as he came to power, he immediately had to deal with foreign affairs and the Cold War. And that actually May, July, August were all extremely busy months for the Cold War. And so I can see in my head now, I really understand the timeline of what's happening when things are overlapping. This is really useful, for example, if you looked, if you were to, to notice that um, there were loads of domestic um, events happening, protests happening, um, unhappiness, disruption at the same time as some very big foreign affair foreign affairs happening or Cold War issues, you notice that the president was split on two sides, that he was perhaps focusing on foreign affairs and therefore ignoring or um, domestic affairs were suffering. And it's really helpful in that regard. So this is what I do. Now, when I end up with this, once it's done, I feel far more confident and happy moving forward and that I really understand what's happening. You can then use this as a referral point. You can go back to it, print it out, have it in you know lovely plastic wallets, in a folder you've got everything you could possibly need to understand what's happening if you're asked to track the um progression of rebellion under the tudors and who had the most rebellions you find the rebellion column you can see it easily if you can notice actually that rebellions are increasing when we have less domestic or less um, emphasis on the economy or less emphasis on society or changes or you know legislation in that sense there you go, you've already started to see how these things interact. Step three, okay, this is where things get a bit more um, nitty gritty. We get really into kind of how do I actually answer essay questions because I've done this amazing timeline. It's taken me 20 hours to do. I feel really happy with all the content, but how does that help me answer questions? Now, I'm switching over to the Tudors now to kind of exemplify this. So um, I'm using the Tudor topic. Now, what I like to do is I like to think about my themes and I like to do this for each monarch or each leader. 
And then I like to go back to, if you remember that very first um, suggestion I made to you, when you're first reading the textbook, when you're first going through your notes, try and come out with those key questions, okay? What are those key things the textbook is pushing you to think about? Now, another place that you can go to to help you do that is the specification again, often even states the questions. Um, but the textbooks are really, really good at making it kind of clear. And if you really don't know, if you're really struggling, often you can kind of think about was it successful or not? You know, was Nixon successful in domestic policy? Was um, Elizabeth successful in financial policy? That's kind of an easy go to. So what I've done is I've gone through each of the themes for Elizabeth I, and those are the themes that I've found in exactly the same way as the American dream. I got the specification, I noticed the trends, so I could have any one of the Tudor monarchs in my monarch column. I could have Henry, um, Edward, Mary, any of them. And I've come up with the main question for each of the themes. Now, these are the questions where really, if I answer that question, I'm covering most of the entire chapter or most of the topic um, on, on that theme. Now, sometimes you might have two, sometimes even three, but mostly, most of the time, this can be kind of narrowed down into one key question. If you can tell me how successful Elizabeth's government functioned, you're probably going to be going into all of the different areas that the um, specification and the um, textbook go through within that chapter. You're gonna go through the role of Sesu, you're gonna go through the fact that the government became less effective by the 1590s. You're probably gonna be edging on to the role of faction and how that played. So we're really trying to think about those key questions that actually, if you know the answer to those questions, you have a really good step up in answering any question at all about that theme. Then what I like to do, and this is where it might be a little more difficult and you might need to spend a bit more time on it and think it through, but I like to make generic essay plans. And this really is the key to progressing to an A-star, particularly if you don't find history um, you know, naturally, you're, you're, you find it a bit more challenging, perhaps. I've known students go from C's to A's, from B's to A stars, by focusing on these generic essay plans. For the purposes of this exemplar, I'm going to show you a focus on the court and ministers theme. And so we're thinking about that key question of how successful was Elizabeth's government? How successfully did it function? So. I'm going to give you the trick now to answer any question that could possibly come up under courts and ministers. So first of all, I've got my key question. Now I'm going to think, are there any additional sub questions that come up under this topic? If you're not sure how to do this, go to the textbook and it will be kind of probably quite obvious to you because it will go through um, all the content and from the content you can you can see what the questions are. So under this topic, I think the key sub questions are how successfully is she in terms of governing the, the government? Why does the government grow weaker? And what was the most important reason the government functioned effectively? OK, is it her? Is it Cecil? Is it somebody else? Is it the fact that there's or faction is kept to a minimum? Um, what's the reason under Elizabeth? Then what I like to do is I like to think of a conclusion for each one of those sub questions and I write it out and I try to include as much high level vocabulary as I can. I try to um, really make it a very, very good conclusion that if I wrote were to write that in the exam, I'd be very, very happy with myself. Um, and I have time to concentrate on making sure it flows, it's fluid, it's convincing, it, has good vocabulary, all those things. So I write myself pre thought out conclusions to those key sub questions and you can see some examples here. <clears throat> I also like to collect any historiography I have on the topic. So here I've got a collection of quotations by historians on the role of court and ministers and the effectiveness of Elizabeth's government. Now I found these by going through different historiography. Um, you can go to books, for example, if you're studying the Tudors, you should be reading Elton, you should be reading John Guy. 
um, Susan Fry, any of those kind of main key famous historians who write about the Tudors, go to their book, get the chapter, find the chapter, or find the index on government and ministers and read some of it. Try to find some quotations. As another idea, you can also just put into Google um, historiography on the effectiveness of Elizabeth's government. And you might be able to find somebody who has kind of done an appraisal or a review of multiple other works, academic works, or perhaps they're just doing a review of the historiography and they'll give you loads of quotations in there um, to, to think about. So I like to collect these historians at this point. Next thing to do is to think about any and all of the factors within the theme. Now, again, if you don't know how to, where to start with thinking about this, go to the textbook. The textbook will go through in subheadings and paragraphs all of the important factors. Now, if you go to the um, chapter on government and ministers under Elizabeth, these are the factors you will find. You'll find, sorry, you'll find, for example, the role of women, in, in Elizabeth's chamber because Elizabeth had a very unique situation compared to her predecessors in the fact she was a woman and the fact that she split the private and the public sphere. Um, she only had women in her private chambers and she only had men in the, in the um, Privy Council. She's the first person where those did not overlap at all. So there was no competition for power between the inner sphere of Elizabeth's body, essentially, and the political sphere. You'll find the role of Cecil is important. You'll find the role of faction is important to understand. Um, you'll find the role potentially of Dudley and Dudley versus Cecil. And you'll find all those factors within the textbook. Now, what I like to do when I write about my factors is I like to title the factor and then I like to think about the key points within that factor. So, for example, if I was looking at um, foreign threats to Elizabeth and I was thinking about my different foreign threats, I would be thinking about Spain, Ireland, France, Scotland. And then within each of those, I'd be thinking about why were they a threat? Why weren't they a threat? Are there any nuances, any third points I'd like to explore? So as an example for Scotland, you might suggest that Scotland could have been a threat and then you would list the reasons why, the old alliance, for example. Um, actually, Scotland weren't a threat. They were an ally of Elizabeth's and then you can give all the evidence for that. However, Mary, Queen of Scots, who was Scottish and was um, ejected from the Scottish throne, essentially, became a threat and you might want to go into why she was a threat and you continue so Spain why was Spain a threat all the evidence you can find to defend that why was Spain not a threat all the evidence you can find to defend that actually Spain was more of a threat when they united with other Catholic nations and then you give all the evidence you can find to defend that and you end up with a long essay plan with every single factor within the um, topic the theme that could possibly be asked about. Now, you're never going to write an essay on all of these, of course, but this is a generic essay plan for the entire theme. So on that piece of paper in front of you, actually, you should now have all the information you need to answer any question at all on that entire theme, anything that came up. There's all the information there. It's already analysed. It's already got topic sentences and points and split into points and evidence, and you've got it sorted. <clears throat> now we're gonna apply it. So I'm going back to the American Dream topic just to show you here, but what I've got is one of these essay plans um, in front of me. So this one's quite short because this particular topic um, about why did Nixon win the election is not particularly um, broad or there's not so much information on it, but I've got my conclusion at the top to answer the question, why did he win the election? That's my opinion. I've already thought about my opinion. I've already written out my conclusion. And then underneath, I've got my point. So for, for this example, the points are actually he won it because of himself and he should be credited with that. He won it um, because the Democrats lost the election or he won it because Johnson's presidency created a void for him to fill and that Johnson was essentially so bad or made so many mistakes 
that um, it was easy for him. And as you can see, I've got in purple my anal analytic point, and then underneath I've listed all the evidence I can um, come up with that would prove that it's right, so I can use those as evidence in my essay. Underneath Nixon's strengths, I've also done actually um, why was he weak, so I've kind of compared that immediately for my own knowledge, my own understanding from writing the essay. Then I'm going to either go to the textbook, go to the AQA exam board website, or simply use my mind and my brain to try and write a list of as many different questions as I possibly can for this topic. So I'm only focusing on political election for Nixon. And I've come up with, as an example, three different questions here that you might get in your um, exam. So we've got Richard Nixon won the 1968 election because of Johnson. He won because of divisions in the Democrat Party. And Richard Nixon is not responsible for his success in the 1968 election. They're all the same question. And what you'll find is that now that you understand the theme, the points, the conclusion, you should be able to assess which essay questions are actually essentially the same question. Within a theme, if you have a broader theme, you might have more than one type of question. And in a moment, I'm gonna explain foreign threats under Elizabeth I going back to the Tudor paper, because there are more than one option in terms of question for that topic, but there's still only about three. And yet I could come up with about 20 different questions. So what you need to get clear in your head is that these are the same question and that you can ahead of time come up with the same conclusion. In the exam, you just need to tailor that conclusion to fit the essay question itself. So as an example, here is my conclusion that I had on my previous essay plan. Um, so I've literally just taken it from the conclusion above me here. I've taken that whole conclusion and I've put it here for you. This is my conclusion on why Nixon won the election. Now, all I need to do is to change some of the words to copy paste or in the exam to copy out and adapt some of the sentences so that it answers the question in front of you. Richard Nixon won the 1968 presidential election because of Johnson's policies. And as you can see, I've written my opinion. Richard Nixon won the 1968 election because of Johnson's policies, which had become increasingly unpopular by continuing the war in Vietnam. Another significant reason was the weakness and division surrounding the Democrat candidature. Therefore, the media rhetoric of democratic distrust and contextual volatility that surrounded it created a power vacuum Nixon was able to fill through his somewhat successful campaign strategy. Now that conclusion directly comes from my conclusion here. It's just been adapted so that it actually fits the question in front of me. The next thing I've done is I've thought of my paragraphs. Now at this point, if you haven't watched my video on how to structure an essay, I really advise you go and do that because I explain um, my three part essay structure there, but I like to stick to agree, disagree and nuance. Now I'm thinking about this particular question. I'm thinking about here are my points, which ones do I want to take out and put into my essay like building blocks. Okay, I've got four building blocks in front of me, which three of those work for this essay. So I can either think about Nixon and his strengths, why Nixon wasn't strong, the Democrats division and losing the election, or the fact that Johnson um, created this void by being so unpopular. So what I've decided to do is paragraph one, agree, I'll go with Johnson. Paragraph two, disagree. I'm gonna talk about Nixon's campaign strat strategy and talk about why he was good. And then finally, I'm going to nuance that and find that really good A star balance and say, actually, democratic failings, both by Johnson and the political divisions, coincided to create that power vacuum that Nixon filled. And I'm going to say in my conclusion, it was not one singular reason. And if you want to know why I'm doing this, obviously, please go and watch that other video because I talk about A star conclusions and nuance. But I've come up with a nuanced. Um, paragraph three. And that paragraph three is simply taking from the Democrats lost the election paragraph 
And it's kind of interweaving that with um, a couple of points from a couple of the other paragraphs. So it's really easy once you've done these essay plans, you can really pick and choose what you want. Now, what I've done now is I'm gonna show you how I've done all those other questions, um, how I've done them. So I've done the first one, we've gone through that together. The second one, Richard Nixon won the 1968 election because of divisions in the Democratic Party. Okay, so paragraph one, I want to agree with the question. Divisions in the Democratic Party. There's my first paragraph taken directly from here. I literally take the block, I put it in the essay, I write it up. Paragraph two, I want to disagree. So again, I'm going to go for actually, no, Nixon did um, a decent job. And this is all the things he did that were good. And then paragraph three, Democratic failings both by Johnson and the current um, political divisions created the power vacuum. The last one, slightly different, it's talking about the fact that Nixon was not responsible for his success. So I want to start by talking about the fact that Johnson left um, a void and that there were divisions in the Democratic Party. Paragraph two, again, I'm disagreeing. I'm saying actually, no, Nixon did do some good things. And paragraph three, I'm going with my nuance, and I'm going to say democratic failings, both by Johnson and the current political divisions, coincided to create this power vacuum. What you should be noticing is these are the same essays, they are just in slightly different orders, okay? And that's why we make these generic essay plans. Now, I'm going to do the same thing with a slightly um, more difficult, more challenging theme. This is the theme of how did Elizabeth deal with threats from abroad in the Tudors topic. Um, so we're thinking here about Spain, Mary, Queen of Scots, France, etc. Elizabeth I. Now, as you can see above me, I've got two conclusions. I haven't got the one, I've got two, because really I wanted to pre-think about what was the main threat but also why did the Spanish Anglo-Spanish relationship break down? Because Spain is a huge topic in this particular part of the course. If you go through the textbook, you'll notice they have far more time dedicated to them than any other country. In the specification, they have more emphasis. So I'm pre-thinking perhaps the exam board see Spain in a more important light than say France. So I'm making sure I've thought of that conclusion ahead of time. I've got my historiography again, as you can see, and I've got a special little section of historiography here just on Mary Queen of Scots because she's important as well. She also has her own section, so I know she's important too. Then what I've done on my essay plan is I'm going through each of my factors. Now this essay plan is a lot longer than the Nixon one. This was about five pages because I go through Mary Queen of Scots and why she was a threat. On the other hand, she wasn't a threat. Um, she's more of a threat, not because she wanted the throne, but because she's seen as a Catholic claimant. And I'm going through all of those points that you could possibly want to write about in any essay. Then I go through Scotland, then I go through France, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. So this time, in terms of questions, what I've done is I've done the same format. I've gone through the textbook, I've gone through the AQA website, I've looked at the past papers, I've gone to everything I possibly can, and I've come up with questions. Now, Within this topic, we firstly think about what was the who was the most important threat from abroad, but there is also some overlap in this topic with the domestic topic about whether domestic or foreign threats were more important. We also have some overlap with the religious topic about whether religious threats from abroad or religious threats from home were more important. Now, some of those conclusions I have written on my essay plans for the other topics. That's why they're not all here, for example. But for some of these questions, you're going to need to kind of overlap a couple of your themes. So as you can see, and if you pause the video and want to read through them, I've got my list of questions here that I think could come up. Um, I think there could be even more than this, but I haven't written them all out. For example, you could have every single country was the greatest threat to Elizabeth I. How far do you agree? Um, but what I'm going to do is now focus on a couple of them to show you how you might approach the different styles of question within this topic and to prove that, again, these are the same question. There might be three of them. There's which foreign power was the greatest threat? Were Catholics a threat at all? And if they were foreign or domestic? And um, what was the last one? Were domestic or foreign threats more threatening? But it's the same essay. So... Here's my conclusion, who is the greatest threat from abroad? 
I personally believe Mary Queen of Scots is the greatest threat, and I would argue that. Um, I know I, I have a strong opinion on that. That's my opinion. You don't have to agree. This is my conclusion. I think Mary Queen of Scots unites the Catholic um, threats, and therefore she gets Spain behind her, France, the Pope, and Ireland. Well, not Ireland in the extent because she's been executed by that point, but Spain are then um, then use Ireland as a kind of a stepping stone. Um, if this is confusing you because you don't study the Tudors, don't worry so much about that. But anyway, I believe Mary Queen of Scots acts as, as an initial unifier for Catholic um, foreign powers, and therefore that's why she is a threat. So I've got my question. Scotland posed more of a threat to England's security during Elizabeth's reign than either Spain or France. Now, I think this is a really difficult question because actually there is a nuance to the question that you need to kind of unpick in your introduction and as you answer the, the essay, because Scotland itself did not pose a significant threat to England's security. Instead, Scotland was one of Elizabeth's most consistent international and religious allies. However, Scotland's monarchical tensions created the magnet, and I've used one of my historians there, that both Spain and France united against England behind Mary, Queen of Scots. Mary's claim to the throne means she became the focus for multiple plots and rebellions against Elizabeth's life. Thus, indirectly, Scotland posed more of a threat to England than Spain or France. I took that from this, I just changed it slightly. In terms of my essay plan, paragraph one, agree with the essay question, so Scotland could have been a threat. Paragraph two, disagree. Spain and France were a significant threat because why were they a greater threat? Paragraph three, my nuance. Actually, it was Mary Queen of Scots who came from Scotland, who was the greatest threat. So the factors from my essay plan, Mary Queen of Scots, Scotland, Spain, France, and Ireland, and here is four different essay plans that I have as an example. So we've got um, the most significant threat to Elizabeth came from the Catholics within her kingdom rather than the Catholic powers abroad. So I would either go with agree, Catholics within the king kingdom were a threat, disagree, Catholic powers abroad were a threat, nuance, Mary Queen of Scots was the greatest threat and united Catholic powers both at home and abroad. And you use as an example, the um, rebellions and plots against Elizabeth's life that wanted to replace her with Mary and the fact that both Spain and France supported those, um, those plots. Or your third paragraph, you could go in with actually Catholic threats were not significant at home or abroad. Foreign powers were only a threat when they were Catholic. So agree, Catholic threats, for example, Spain, you could do a whole paragraph on Spain if you wanted. Paragraph two, disagree. Catholic nations were not always able to threaten Ireland, Spain, um, other than the Armada. And paragraph three, the nuance, Catholic powers never had the support of domestic Catholics, so therefore never presented a significant threat to Elizabeth. And finally, Spain was the greatest threat to Elizabeth's reign. Paragraph one, agree, Spain was a significant threat. Paragraph two, disagree, France and Ireland were also a threat. Pick one or do both if you really want to. And paragraph three, Mary Queen of Scots was the greatest threat, notably when she unified Spain and other Catholic nations. These are the same question. There's three questions within this theme you really could be asked. The top one, the bottom one are essentially the same. We're just putting the building blocks in a different order. We're inserting Scotland and then Spain and Mary Queen of Scots. Down here, we're doing Spain and France and Mary Queen of Scots. It's the same. The middle two, as I said, overlap slightly with the two other themes um, of religion and of domestic stability. Um, so you would need to also understand those and then insert paragraphs from those to make that work. But what I'm really trying to show you is that if you do make these generic essay plans and then if you sit there and plan every single essay question you can possibly think of just to this extent don't do any more than this i would suggest that you do your argument as well and you practice tailoring those conclusions to different essay questions you will be the most prepared person in the room any question that comes up even if you can't remember word for word what you wrote you will remember the gist of what you wrote if you remember that one main conclusion you can then adapt it in the exam setting 
trust me, if you have even once thought about it and written an essay plan to this extent, and you've then remembered the, the basis of your generic essay plan, you'll be able to replicate it and you'll do really, really well. This I think is the most surefire way to be successful in your history A-level exam. Now, that is my kind of five step guidance on how to revise A-level history. Please like the video and subscribe and leave me a comment if you would like more of these, um, perhaps some individual themed videos. I can go through individual themes and I can run you through the essay plans of individual themes, my generic essay plans. I can give them to you through the videos. Um, so let me know in the comments and like the video if that's what you would find helpful. Um, and yeah, that'd be great because I need to know what I can do to support you. So thank you and please subscribe if you haven't already.